Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship at North Fairfield United Methodist Church. Welcome to those in the building today. Yay. Welcome, yes. <laughs> welcome to those um, joining us online as well, um, either this morning or later this week, whenever it fits into your calendar. So, so glad to be back in God's house today with all of your smiling faces. I imagine behind your masks are smiling. So, welcome. Glad you could join us here today. Just a couple of reminders, of course. We'll be wearing our masks. We will be singing behind our masks. So, you know, don't pass out or anything if you're not getting enough air, but do your best there. We'll be glad to hear your voices, and Dwight will be leading us um, as well in our singing, so we're thankful for that today. Um, we will share our joys and our concerns. If you're watching online and you want to mention those in the chat, we'll make sure that we share those. And then in the sanctuary, you'll just, you know, yell it out to me, and, and I'm sure we'll be able to hear you and, and share that as well. Um, our offering will continue to be dropped in the little church on the back table, or if you're mailing that in, that's fine to continue doing that as well. So we, again, we will not be um, passing the plates as we traditionally would. There is hand sanitizer around for you, and we just ask that if you want to visit with one another, that you would do so um, outside where it's just a little bit safer to do that. So welcome. Glad you're here with us today. Um, one other just brief announcement. There is a board meeting on March 17th here at the church at 630. Are there any other announcements that you would lift up today? All righty. Well, seeing none, please stand if you are able and join us in our first hymn, number 657. This is the day, and we will sing through twice. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving God, we are so grateful for this day that you have gifted to us. We're so grateful for the sun streaming through the windows and lighting our smiling faces. We're thankful to be back in your holy presence in this place and in many places today. Lord, we offer this time to you. We offer our hearts to you. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be with us in this place, opening our hearts and our minds to what you have planned for us. And we pray all this in the holy name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Well, y'all sound good in case you wondered. <laughs> our first scripture, this reading, comes from Genesis. Chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, 15, and 16.
God for the people of God. Well, friends, we do have much to be thankful for. Obviously, today we're thankful to be back again together and safely. Um, and, and so many smiling faces here with us, healthy faces, happy to see that. Um, so just, obviously, we still can't hug, but sending you all hugs as well. So I am grateful for that today. Grateful for the sun shining today and yesterday. And I noticed yesterday, um, as I contemplated working in my flower beds, but it was still too cold, um, there are little sprigs of green stuff showing. So perhaps you have the same thing happening at your place. So thankful to be here together um, to keep going and to, to look forward to new life and the new season that God is calling us into. And so as we think of the many things that we're thankful for, we also think about giving our gifts back to God. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are overflowing with gratitude today for the many gifts that you have poured into our lives, uh, for this church family, for this opportunity to worship together and apart as well, for new life, for new vision, for a new journey and a new season that you call us to. Lord, we offer our gifts back to you today, our hearts, our resources, our voices lifted in praise. We ask that you would take each gift, that you would multiply them, that you would show us the way to use them, that others may know the love and the mercy and the saving grace of your Son, Jesus the Christ. And we pray all of this in his holy and precious name. Amen. We'll now share in our joys and our concerns. Are there those that you would lift up today? Yeah, Elaine. Praise God that you're here with us. Is he? Are you, are you home from work still? You are retired. Well, praise God for that, too. <laughs> but prayers for Elaine. <laughs> Aren't you glad you're back? <laughs> are there others that we would lift up today? My brother, my great-grandson is here. Yes, Tyler's here with us today. I know we've had some, we've missed some birthdays. It's been a year, so happy birthday, everybody. <laughs> everybody that we've, we've missed, and happy anniversary. Um, new babies that were born, I'm sure. We just don't know everything that's happened, so we're, we're joyful for that as well. Any other prayers or concerns that you left? Dottie. Yeah, I'm excited. I can lift my arms. Yay! <laughs> I was thinking when you walked in this morning, you looked just like the last time I saw you. No. <laughs> yeah. So I'm thankful for progress and prayers for those who are still continuing to progress um, through their healing as well. Yes, Patsy. Is she doing okay? She's good. Okay. So uh, joys for that, that she's doing well. Is she having any pain or just the pain of having been in an accident. Okay, we'll pray for her as well. Um, I would lift up some concerns this morning um, for those of you that might be on Fireland's Electric or not be. They have a big outage this morning that they've planned. So they have several line workers working from their company, from a contractor, from um, Ohio Edison as well. So 
it's a big job this morning, so they're hoping to get that done and, and get that done safely. So we just lift them up as they're working out there today. Um, we continue to pray for all of those um, dealing with the COVID virus. We know we're not completely past it, obviously. So our healthcare workers, um, those who are sick right now, uh, those who are waiting patiently to get their vaccine, we lift up everyone who's waiting as well. Um, we lift up our schools as they do have several difficult decisions to make, although they are back in session for the most part. We have things like proms and graduations quickly approaching. Um, and so we lift up our decision makers as they try to make the best decisions for our young people. We lift up um, this church and, and all of our churches and, of course, those who are grieving today for various reasons as well. And we will be praying for those who are healing from surgeries and, and other injuries. So as we think of these, if there are no others, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, as your sunshine pours in through these windows, we are yet reminded of your holy presence with us and the many ways in which you bring joy into our lives. For visitors here in worship today, for the ability to be back together, for signs of spring and new life, we celebrate all the birthdays that we've missed together, the anniversaries and the victories. We're grateful for Kevin and Dottie who are healing so well, getting back to life, and enjoying a new journey as well. Lord, we are thankful. For everything that we're thankful for, we do have a list of concerns as well. We continue to pray for all of those who are affected by the COVID virus. Um, all of those who it affects their work and their life, their finances, their health. We pray for our health care workers who continue to work so many long hours and put themselves at risk as well. We pray for those working today to keep the power on, to make it better, and to restore it as well. We just ask that you would place a hedge of protection around each and every one. We lift up all those who grieve today for various reasons, for the loss of a loved one, or perhaps a relationship, or their job, whatever it happens to be, Lord, we just ask that you would be close to those who are grieving today. We lift up those who are in the healing process. We ask that you would continue to strengthen them and to help them get back to their usual activities. And Lord, we also pray for this church and all your churches as we face new journeys, new seasons, a new vision as we return to worship in this new world that we're in as well. Lord, we just ask that your presence would be with us, that your Holy Spirit would be upon us, that you would give us wisdom and grace and mercy. We pray all of this as your disciples, as your children who have been taught to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How good it is to hear your voices. Our next hymn that we will join in together is number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Please stand as you are able. Good 
you may be seated. Our next scripture reading today is from Romans chapter 4, verses 3 through 8 and 13 through 25. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Paul goes on to say, It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing. And the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace, and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our Father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being the things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his face and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness For us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we enter into this new journey of Lent together, we remember that you are the one that has called us each by a new name. We remember that we walk with Jesus wherever he leads us. Help us to put aside our fears, our doubts, our longings. Lord, as believers, help us to seek to trust you who always surprises us and to trust your promises as they have taken on the flesh and the blood of the good news that is called Jesus. Lord, open our hearts and our minds today to something new. We pray all of this in the holy name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, friends, what a journey we have been on these last 12 months. Now, it seems like just yesterday that we learned these new words like covid or as my kids call it, the Rona. We learned pandemic, which had never been in my vocabulary ever. We learned about social distancing, which somewhat as an introvert, I've come to like. I'm not sure if anybody else has. (laughs) We've learned about masks as well and the various colors and styles that we can have. We made it through the toilet paper shortage, hopefully. There was that coin shortage that I could never quite figure out because I had them laying all over my house. There was this bicycle shortage that we had this past summer. I couldn't find one anywhere. We learned how to worship online. We learned how to worship in our kitchens or on the sofa. 
You probably remember sharing worship from my dining room table with a cat that was in heat. <laughs> That's been fixed. Um, there were train whistles, there were dying batteries. I think that was all in, in one day. We had communion probably with wheat bread, white bread, whole grain bread, crackers, or maybe you had a hot dog bun. But whatever has happened on this journey, it has likely changed the way we see the world, at least the little piece of it that we are connected to. It has perhaps even changed the way that we are willing to experience our faith. It might have changed the way in which we choose to journey with God and the ways in which we choose to accept and to live into the fullness of God's promises, those promises that he has for his beloved. And so I would think it would be safe to say that after 12 months, after all of this started, life looks just a little bit different, maybe. And you know, we often say that God doesn't change. You've probably heard that. God doesn't change. We often say that God is the same God that he was yesterday at the beginning of time, the same God that he is today, the same God he will be tomorrow and, and all of our tomorrows to come. And while I do wholeheartedly believe that that is true, that God does not change, the other truth that I know is that we do that people do change. Now, quite frankly, we should be getting more accustomed to one thing, and that thing is change. We should be growing. We should be learning. Hopefully, at some point, we mature. Still working on that. We become more accepting, more forgiving, more gracious, more merciful, Perhaps we even become more open to the promises of God and this call that God has placed on our lives as people of promise, as people of hope, as disciples. And so we begin this season of Lent together, and I know we're a little bit late, so we could finish the book of Acts, but we will explore the ways in which we are growing in our ability to embrace the fullness of God's promises. And specifically in this season of Lent, this promise of resurrection, of new life. Together we'll explore what it means to rend our hearts and to claim the promise of resurrection, to walk with Jesus on this journey that we have been called to. So we start with, what does it mean to rend our hearts? Maybe you remember reading or hearing that through the prophet Joel that God told the people of Judah to rend your hearts and not your garments. You see, the people of Judah had become a wealthy and influential people, and so they didn't need God anymore. And they began to take God for granted. They became self-centered. They were greedy. They were idolatrous and, and really quite sinful. In Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, the people are instructed to rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. He is slow to anger and abounding in love. Well, if you lived in that time, if you were deeply sorry, you would often show it by tearing or rending your clothing, your garments. But through Joel, God says, that's not what I want from you. I don't want you to just tear and show me something on the outside, but I need you to rend your heart, to make a change on the inside to change the heart, to tear it away from your sinful ways, from the ways of the world, and turn it back to God. This rending of the heart is the call to true repentance, not just being sorry for our sinful ways, but a true turning away from sin, a true change of a heart, a real turning to the Lord, to accept and to receive the fullness of God's promises, specifically the promise of resurrection. So how do we do that, right? 
How do we not only walk this journey with Jesus with all of its twists and its turns and its potholes and the detours and there's those delays that irritate us? How do we do that without getting distracted by all of that? How do we stay on this journey with its ups and its downs and, and do all of that with a heart that is really turned away from this world with all of its distractions? But to do that with a heart that is turned to Jesus, a heart that is locked in on the promises of God, sounds like a big job. It sounds like it would take some strength, some patience, a lot of grace, some mercy, and a whole bunch of trust. Now, it does seem odd that we enter into this journey through Lent in the story of Abraham and Sarah, that ancient story. But at its core, it is a story of trust. It's a story that required Abraham and Sarah both to go on a really long journey with God. A journey that saw its fair share of potholes and detours, delays, and redirection. It's a story of promises kept, even if the receiver of the promise could not yet see how the promise would come to pass. But they walked in faith anyways. They walked before God in trust. Well, this journey that we are on with Christ is a story of trust. It's a story of us walking in faith even when we cannot see or even when we cannot even imagine how God's promises will play out. Especially this promise of resurrection, how will it play out in the end? We keep going, though, right? We keep going. 24 years before our visit with Abraham and Sarah today, God had already made a promise to Abraham. He had already promised to give him a son. God had promised a son to Abraham when he was 75 years old, and now today in our reading, he is 99 years young. That's a long time to wait on a promise. And this time, God is promising more than just this one son. God is promising to make Abraham the father of many nations, of an entire people. But God said, I'm going to need something from you too. In this covenant, in this promise, God said, I need something from you. Abraham, I need you to walk before me faithfully and to be blameless. Abraham, I need you to go where you can't yet see how the promise will play out. I need you to do it faithfully and with a clean heart. Abraham had already walked in this last promise of God for some 24 years, and he had not yet seen it come to fruition. Now, if you know the story, you know that Abraham and Sarah at one time take matters into their own hands, and there is a son. But God's promise was the son of their own flesh, and this promise still remained. And now at 99, God is asking Abraham and Sarah, both of them, to keep the faith, to keep walking in faith, to keep trusting to be blameless before God. If you know their story, you know that in the past, Abraham and Sarah had messed up. They made decisions that hurt those that they loved. They, they made decisions because they were tired of waiting on God. They got distracted by the pitfalls and the potholes of life. They were disappointed in the delays. And yet God comes to them again. And he invites them yet again into covenant, asking them to keep going with him, to keep trusting him, to do so blamelessly. God's asking them to rend their hearts, to turn fully back to him, 
as they anticipate that this leg of the journey is about to be that promise fulfilled. God's promise is nearing fruition, and they would need a renewed faith. They would need a renewed trust and renewed hearts as well. Abraham and Sarah at 99 had to trust their next steps to God. They had to trust that even after 24 years that the God of all righteousness would fulfill his promise to them, even if they couldn't see how. This was a big trust on their part. But friends, isn't it also a big trust that we put in the promise of salvation? Our human minds cannot reconcile how or when resurrection for the believer occurs. If we weren't too afraid to admit it, there, we might admit that there's a little peace in all of us that wonders, how did the resurrection of Jesus occur? Logistically speaking, how did it happen? And for us, the resurrection of believers, how will it happen? I can't wrap my mind around it. Perhaps you can't wrap your mind around it either. But we are Easter people. We are resurrection people. And so our only option is to trust. And in my opinion, it's a big trust. Trusting in Jesus to guide our steps. Trusting that we have really been forgiven by the grace of God and not by our works or our acts, that's a big trust. God asked Abraham to walk before him and to be blameless. Jesus asks us in his word to repent, to drop our nets, to pick up the cross and to follow him, it's a big trust. Abraham had no idea how long it might take God to fulfill his promise. He had already waited some 24 years. And he and Sarah were a bit skeptical, perhaps due to their age. But Paul wrote in Romans that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham believed God. Paul wrote that Abraham fully believed that God had the power to do what God had promised. It didn't matter that Abraham and Sarah were both nearly 100 years old. Abraham believed that God had the power to do what he had promised. Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. It wasn't because of any work that he had done or any charitable act that he had done. It was his faith. And according to Paul, these words were not only for Abraham, but they're for all of us, for all of us who walk in faith, for all of us who trust and who wait for the promises of God. Paul wrote in chapter 4, verse 24, that these words were not for Abraham alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is the promise of forgiveness and resurrection guaranteed by the work of the cross, not by our works, but held tight in our faith. Like Abraham, we are called to walk these many years in that faith. And we walk through potholes. We wait through delays. We are sometimes disappointed in our disappointments. We're irritated with the detours. And sometimes we'll be redirected especially often and, and when we cannot see how the promises will play out, it's difficult for us. 
Many times we'll walk this journey with Christ, and like Abraham, we'll be called to walk blamelessly, to rend our hearts, to sacrifice all in the name of trusting Jesus. Six years ago, friends, I began this leg of my faith journey when I accepted God's call to enter pastoral ministry. I have to admit that at the time it was a redirection that I had not anticipated. I could not fully see how it might play out. It was a leap of faith, and it required a rending of the heart and any number of other sacrifices that might come to mind. It was and it is a journey full of promises of God that I cannot yet see how they might play out. And as you might expect, and as you understand, as, as servants of God as well, it is a big trust. To walk in faith, to walk in obedience to the call that God places on our lives as we serve in many capacities, it's a big trust. It requires sacrifice, a change of heart. Many times, God will call us to redirect our faith journey. This will be a big trust on our parts. It will have a big effect on our heart. And so I have to be honest with you that this news that I'm about to share with you is a redirection that I did not expect, nor did I anticipate. It is a big trust, and it greatly affects my heart. And so I share with you today with bittersweet anticipation that as of July 1st, 2021, I will be concluding my pastoral ministry. This was not a decision that was made in haste. It was not made lightly. In fact, like Abraham, God took quite a bit of time with me to come to this decision. In fact, God brought this redirection to me in January of 2020. So I always tell the people I work with, if you have a secret, give it to me, because I can keep a secret. It was after much prayer. It was after much discernment that I shared this with Reverend Doug Lewis um, this past August. I assure you that this decision has not been made because of anything negative. I don't have the words to tell you how loved I feel here. Supported, accepted, lifted up, and encouraged. It has been amazing to join you all in ministry. This faith family I know has taught me more than I could ever teach you. I have learned about community about acceptance, perseverance, faith. I have learned about trust and mercy, a willingness, generosity beyond measure, and so much love. It has truly been a privilege, and I count it as one of the greatest joys of my life. And so imagine my surprise when the Holy Spirit began this process of redirection in me. But like so many times, we, we don't see how the promises will play out. And today, I don't know yet where and how God is calling me to serve next. What I do know is that the call is to the ministry in this community, in my home community, and in others. I do know that my heart is being pulled strongly back to the ministry of the laity of the church. Having been on both sides of the pulpit now, I have a much deeper appreciation for the ministry of the laity. It really is where hearts and lives are being changed. Not that the words that come from the pulpit are not good and holy and helpful, but the laity 
holds hands. They give healing hugs. They are warm smiles. They are sacrificial, self-giving love. So the next question that we have is, what's next for this church, right? That's the natural question. Who will serve this church as the clergy leader? I don't know. (laughs) I do not yet know. I am thankful that Reverend Lewis and the cabinet gave us the time to be back in person for this announcement, and there will be more announcements to come. I am also confident that Reverend Lewis and the cabinet are developing an excellent plan that leads this church into God's new vision for each of us. But for day, today, friends, just for today, I want you to know that it was trust in God that brought me here. It's trust in God that brings all of you here. And even when we cannot see how the promises will play out, the promises of God still remain. We are called to rend our hearts We are called to sacrifice them to God, even and especially when it hurts. We are called to walk before our God in faith when we can't see the way. We are called to trust in God that new life springs forth and that his redirection takes us where God intends for us to go. It is holding tight to the promise of resurrection. We do have a lot more walking to do together. And we will do so with renewed hope, with renewed vision, with renewed hearts. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are thankful even when it hurts. Lord, help each of us to lean into the Holy Spirit, to have rended hearts, hearts that are fully turned to your promises, to your promises of hope, of resurrection, of new life, of a renewed vision. Help us to lean into the many ways which you guide us to serve one another and to do so out of love. Lord, help us to trust even when we cannot see the way forward. Help us to lean into the hope of resurrection and into this journey that you have called us to. Remind us that you have made the way clear, even when we cannot see it. Lord, help us to walk before you in faith, trusting that you have made the way for us. We pray all of this in the holy and precious name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Friends, would you please stand? And join us in our closing hymn today. I don't have the number. 462. 462. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Please stand.
go walking before our God blamelessly and trusting in Jesus go in his love his power and his mercy today tomorrow and forever amen